Um, what I'm going to be going through today is um, the new web tool for Enterprise PDM. Um, to introduce myself, um, uh, my name is Justin Webster. I work for a company called Inflow Technology. We are an uh, implementation uh, company for, uh, for PDM and PLM, and we've been doing ePDM as a specialty for some years now, uh, when it was uh, named Kinesio, back when it uh, first started to come into the SOLIDWORKS channel. Um, and um, our company, we've been involved in um, you know, going on 200 implementations of EPDM. So we've seen a lot of different things, very simple ones to very complex. Um, so what I'm going to be focusing on today is the new Enterprise PDM web tool, and um, aptly named Web2. I'm waiting for a better name than that, but that's what we have right now. Um, so just as a show of hands, how many people here have EPDM implemented in their company? Okay, most everybody, okay. How many people here are administrators? EPDM, okay, a lot of people. Um, how many people have the, the current EPDM web called Web Access installed? A few, okay, all right, so I think that alone is the reason why there's a new web. Um, they wanna make sure that um, you know, there's just better tools for the, uh, for the user community. And, and um, companies have been asking for it for a little while, and, um, and we've seen varying um, pieces and parts of this web tool over the past few years and implemented pieces and parts at several companies and then SOLIDWORKS introduced more formally, um, I would say probably this time last year, at least in uh, introducing the concept and, and their schedule for release. Um, so these are the things I'm gonna be going through, um, just kind of giving you an overview of what the tool is, I'll give you a demo of what it looks like, how it, might, how it looks compared to the current tool some options for installing it, configuring it, um, just to give you some ideas of how that might look. And then also we'll talk about some of the advantages of it, some of the limitations of it, just so you make, you know, you make sure before you just go installing it and, and running with it on, uh, when you get back to the office on Friday, uh, we'll make sure that um, you kind of understand some of the, some of the, some of the trade-offs as well, so. Um, I'll tend to keep talking until somebody interrupts, so if you do have a question, just shout it out. If you want to wait till the end, that's fine. If you want to come up or chase me down the hallway, that's also fine. I'm fast though. Well, not that fast. Um, so EPDM Web 2, what is it? Uh, so it is a web browser that is connected to your EPDM system. You know, that's the, the simplest way of explaining it. So it connects to your EPDM vault and it gives users access into your EPDM vault for various functions. Uh, it's a little bit different than the web access tool, and the other tool, the other web tool didn't really have a name either, but when you're in the uh, in admin tool, you can see it says web access. So that tool, um, uh, one of the main limitations of that tool is that it's um, only available in Internet Explorer and it's kind of clunky to install, and so the new tool, one of the missions of deploying this new web tool is to make sure it's available in multiple browsers. And because it's available in multiple browsers, that it can be available on multiple devices. Um, and really to be easy to use for an average consumer of data. So, um, um, you know, primarily we want to be able to get EPDM out to different people in your company. Most of the people are going to be using it for viewing. So we want to make sure something is easy to use, as easy as, you know, to use as something like Google. You know, so that's really the goal behind how they set up the interface. Um, and then one of the limitations of the previous tool as well is that it could only be used as a contributor type of license. And so it was an editing type of license, not a viewing kind of license. And that was very clear when you log into it because it would take your, your, your CAD editor license. In addition, there's no viewer. So those two pieces alone, you know, doesn't make it easily deployed to shop floor people or viewers. So the new one, the main focus is viewing and um, with also the ability to, to do contributor type functions as well. So some of the capabilities, um, as you might expect, searching is in the tool, uh, viewing is in the tool, viewing does depend on the browser, so Every browser is a little different in its capability, so you do have to understand the differences between the browsers. Um, you can execute workflows in the uh, web tool, 
and that's things like approving something, um, moving an ECO through its process, a project through its process, whatever you're running through a process, you can generally run through this tool. We've tested it on a number of different things. Um, there are a couple limitations which we'll talk about. Um, and one of the one of the things that, um, and we'll talk about this later on too, but one of the big limitations is I can participate in a workflow. What I can't do, I can't initiate one. So if you're used to initiating an ECO or some kind of template inside of your um, EPDM client, the web, you cannot do it from there. So it's really a participant, not an initiator. So that's the main difference there. Um, you can look up contains and where used information from here. Um, generally browse your SOLIDWORKS, that kind of thing, and also um, some of your other documentation, and perform file operations. So if you're gonna check out a file, check in a file, load a file, that kind of thing. Um, and there's also a mobile version, and I'll demonstrate how that's gonna look. Um, just like you might expect, you're logging into a vault. You have a login screen. Um, when the user logs in, you can choose whether or not you're logging in as a viewer or a contributor. Um, it takes the license based on what's installed on your actual server. So we'll go through that a little bit too. Um, so you do have a couple options and then you can also configure whether you want them to launch and connect to you know, Vault A or Vault B if you have multiple vaults at your company. You could actually allow them to choose the vault they're gonna connect to uh, or a test vault, something like that. Once you're logged in, it has full vault browsing, so you can browse your green folders. In fact, the folders in the web are green to make it, uh, to make it the, the same. You can also view um, different grid views of it. Uh, there's columns, there's searching, like I was saying. So to get at the data, um, it's really done in a similar way as if you were browsing in your regular vault. Uh, but one of the benefits is if you're gonna roll this out, especially for companies that are just launching EPDM, if you're gonna roll this out to let's say a shop community or something like that, it cuts down on all the training because you don't have to explain that whole concept of log into a vault view and do all of that. This is basically hit a web page, log in, and there's a box at the top, search here. So it really kind of takes the training and deployment down to the, you know, to a very simple nature. Uh, once we're looking at a file itself, there's preview functionality. Um, you can access the data card of a file um, to some extent, the properties, I guess I should say, so the data that's there. Um, there is a contains and a where use, like I was saying. Um, you can do change states on files, so that's that workflow participation that you can do. You can upload and download files. So if you are on a mobile device, there may not be an embedded viewer, so if you want to download that spreadsheet and open it up on your iPad using that, you know, an iPad app for viewing Excel files, you can do that. Um, does anybody here have uh, um, people actively using iPads at their company or some kind of tablet? Okay. So where this would come into play is if you can connect them to your vault through this mechanism, if they have, let's say, e-drawings for iPad, um, inherently, the preview would not be in the browser because Safari doesn't have an embedded browser or embedded viewer. However, you could download it to your e-drawings for iPad and view it through there. And then in through the web inside of your iPad, you can approve the drawing, that kind of thing. Um, also, like I was saying, uploading and downloading files, which you can do from basically any device as well. So if you did have a, a file you wanted to upload, you could do that. And then the, uh, the viewing as well. So and then depending on the browser, it'll look a little bit different. So they built some functionality so that if I open it up in Internet Explorer, I see a little bit different uh, screen than if I'm opening up in Chrome. So they don't make a button, they don't add, let's say, open and e-drawings to Chrome because Chrome doesn't support that. So they don't put a button there that you can click on and get an error. They just, you know, hide that button. Right? So. It really is best with Internet Explorer. I'm not sure who asked that question. Um, oh, okay. So the question was, is, it, uh, is there a preference, right, on, on the browser to use? Um, it just depends on your, your primary uh, usage of it. If you're looking to get people access to the, the drawings quickly or the files quickly, Internet Explorer is probably your last choice because it's just slower as a browser. 
Um, Chrome is faster, Firefox is faster. But if you need embedded viewing, Internet Explorer is your only option right now um, because of the um, e-drawings components are only supported in Internet Explorer, at least right now. I think they may go Chrome in the future, or they may be working on that, but um, Internet Explorer for now. So a couple different screenshots here from the web. Um, um, this last one is a change state dialog. So you can enter in your comments just like you're uh, approving a drawing and it'll push that along. Um, there's also a mobile version of the tool. And so what's nice about the mobile version is it has a lot of the same capabilities. Um, they actually do allow it to, um, and you can actually access from your, from your PC. So you can access the mobile version of the tool from your PC. And that way you can um, make training material and stuff like that, even, you know, even though it might be hard to do it from like your device. So I could show somebody how to use it without actually showing them on a device. So you can do that through, your, through, a, um, you know, through the mobile site on a PC. I'm gonna show you that. Because I mean, we could all come up here, but I mean, I don't think you could see this from back there. So I'm gonna show it to you here, what it's gonna look like. Um, some of the things you can do in the mobile, um, it does have things like viewing thumbnails, you can view properties. It's a little more limited in all the properties that you can view. Um, you can change some of these things too, so you can cut down on some of the, some of the content that's gonna display in the mobile. That's an iPhone, anybody's ever heard of those? So um, I'm gonna take you through a demo and then we'll discuss some of the other things like installation, configuration choices, um, how you change some settings, and then also uh, some of the limitations and, and what to expect. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. uh, in our EPM environment, we sign on the package directory. Mm -hmm. Do you do that with WebSupport? Yes. All right, so I'm gonna start by just bringing up Internet Explorer and I'll just go through the main login screen. So this is uh, Web2. Um, it has a, um, two choices here, web and viewer. So in case you weren't totally clear, web means editor, viewer means viewing. So they took away this, um, when they first launched it, it had actually a menu there that said contributor. They took that away, because really it, does, it doesn't use necessarily a contributor license. It uses an editing style license. So there, ver the web here means I'm editing, so I'm uploading documents, I'm modifying documents. Viewing means I'm just viewing. Uh, for those who don't know, viewing, you can also approve workflows. So you just can't edit anything. So you may wonder if I have a bunch of editor licenses, will this take an editor license so that my CAD user can't use the editor license? The answer would be yes. It will take one of those. So you can't access your EPDM system without that license, right? So it is gonna consume that license. Which license it takes, if you have a mix of editors and contributor licenses in your environment, when you install this on the server, you have to install a client on the server where you do this interaction. If you install a contributor type client, it will take a contributor license. If you install an editor type license, it will take an editor license. <coughs> So first, when you install this, you realize it's taking one of my CAD users' licenses. You can actually check your server and change how you have that server client installed, and it will change which license it takes here. So I'm gonna log in um, as admin to my vault here, and like I said, uh, you can also make it alternate, so you can choose a different vault. Mine is set up just to choose that vault, um, and it'll log into your environment. Everybody see that? Man, is that small. Not sure if I can make that much bigger. Let me see. Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure how we get rid of that. Is there a, is there a clapper? Oh, is it over here? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, thank you. Send us the bill. So let me uh, let's see. Let's make it like 150. Can you guys see that? I guess the, the text is not that important. 
what, I'm, what I see here is, uh, so there's a menu bar along the top. There's a search screen along the top. And when you look at the menu bar, it's things like check out, check in, things like that. And then if I want to browse through these folder structures, I can just click here to browse and just navigate through the files, through the folders. So it's all, you know, very simple. Oh, we don't have anybody napping back there. So, um, although I have a feeling that vegetable lasagna will keep everybody awake. Oh, it got really dark, okay. Uh, so when you look through the... Um, uh, folder structure, you know, just when you come to a folder where you have a bunch of files, obviously it's going to list the files, it's going to list properties, um, things like checked out by size, days in state, which is the number of days it's been in that workflow. So some of those things are there, and it's going to give you a breadcrumb along the top to show you um, where you are in the vault so you can bounce back to something right away. Um, so that makes it also very easy for mobile devices, because you can tend to get yourself lost on a mobile device very easily, very easily, so it gives you that link, you can just click that link, so you don't have to use back buttons and all that, right? So then as we browse through a folder, um, if we get to a file that has some, some data, uh, some, or a folder that has files in there, you can see you can click on an individual file, there's a little fly out arrow next to it um, that you can go and hit things like the data card it contains, things like that. So that brings up a, you know, like a list of your references, let's say. Now, it's, it's um, one thing that's important to note here is this is not a bill of material. And so hopefully they'll add that kind of thing in there at some point. But right now it's just a contains tab. So it's not like a bill of material you can make a report out of. So in the, or a, so in the same with, a, you know, obviously a where used is a little more, um, you know, you're a little bit more used to seeing it in this structure. But so this would be a contains and a where used, not a bill of material. So that's the that's the main difference. And we do find a lot of people want to see a bill of material on the web. So hopefully that'll be something that they'll put in there. Um, so some of that you can access right from this little uh, this this icon here. I'll tell you that's a little bit hard to get on an iPad. So uh, they do have buttons up here as well. So once you've entered, you know, once you click on the file. It'll take you into a little section where you can do a contains and a where used using the button. So, uh, and it also gives you a thumbnail of the file itself. And then also in here we can look at, let's say, the data card. That'll show us some information on the file itself as well. So this is our data card. You can see we have different configurations here. Um, also, again, our breadcrumb is here, and it also gives you a hyperlink to the file. Um, from here as well, we can do checkouts, we can download. So if you want to get the file downloaded to your iPad, just hit download. Um, in fact, um, um, when you also click on the file, it'll actually prompt you to download on an, I on an iPad as well. And then we can also change state. So this particular file is sitting in uh, under major change, I can submit this for approval, and it'll bring up a box to do that. So, and if you're writing properties and things like that through the process, it'll write the properties to the file. Um, it'll do all the things you would expect, generally speaking, from a workflow standpoint, with a couple exceptions, which I'll, I'll cover. Um, also from within the interface here, we can, there's a button over here for uh, what's called a tiles view. So it shows, you to, shows it to you like this. So if you like that, and you can click that. Um, sometimes on, uh, on mobile devices it looks a little nicer in the tiles view, um, but it'll leave it like that until you switch it back. And then it also has a, um, a next um, down at the bottom here for going to the next page. If, it's, if you've searched for something and you have more than what you can show on a single page, you'll hit next and next. And then you can do some settings here on how many you want to show per page. Uh, so that's pretty nice as well for trimming that up. And you do have some config options where you can control some of that. If you wanted to, let's say, upload a file, we could do that. So let me, let me show you how that works. So let's go into, that's a, I gotta look at it this way, that's, that other way is annoying to me. So let's go into here, I'll upload a file. So to upload, we pick the button upload. And then we can just browse into, into any files. Let's, so let's say, let me browse into, oh, let's upload our enterprise software here. 
our software guide. So I'm going to upload an enterprise PDM admin guide because you want all the users seeing that, right? So you would normally put that in your vault. Installation guide, yeah, that's a good one. How about app administration guide? So we'll put that in. You hit upload and it goes and uploads. If you pick multiples, that's fine too. It'll show you like this little, it'll show each one on a separate line and it'll show its a status, a little status bar as it's uploading. So it's pretty nice. Um, they're doing a good job with the, uh, with the interface here. And then obviously when you, when you actually upload it, it will check it in for you. So it's not a concept where you might be used to in the, in the regular client where you add it and then check it in. This one, it just checks it in for you on the upload. So it makes it really easy for people looking to just add content. Maybe, it's your, maybe you have a project structure folder, uh, folder structure that's, you know, where you're keeping projects in line. You know, you give people access to here, they could load up their Word documents or whatever um, uh, from their mobile device or from their PC without having the client installed. I'm sorry, what was the question? So if you have mandatory information on the card, it just lets it load it in. I mean, so it's loaded in essentially using the API. And so um, um, you may need to change the strategy a little bit for things like that. Um, uh, so there are, some, uh, there are some things that it forces. Uh, and that's, I'm not sure you asked that question, but that's one of them. And there's also some things in workflow conditions and things like that that you need to be aware of. Um, also, so when I'm looking at a document like this, if I want to click on, let's say, a PDF, so it'll handle a little bit differently. Um, so the PDF, uh, if I want to download it, I can click on this button, it'll download it. Uh, so we can do that. So if you click on the file and you don't have an embedded viewer, let's say, it'll download the file itself. So let's think about that for a minute. Maybe more minutes than what I want to wait for. Um, and then things like, uh, if I can jump through here and look at um, spreadsheets, I can show you a couple things there too, as far as the viewer goes. Okay, what's going on? I think I've hung, hung in. What was I saying about Internet Explorer? Maybe. Nope. That's a good opportunity to show you what it looks like in Chrome. So let's go into Chrome. So very similar. Um, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. So you can see that. So very similar, obviously, in its layout. So when we come into, uh, uh, into Chrome, obviously the folder structure is very similar. It does look a little bit different once you're into a file. So it will make a PDF of, a, of let's say, a spreadsheet, and we'll give you a little preview like this. It'll do this in Internet Explorer as well, um, where it kind of gives you this scrolling thing so you can look at the information. You really can't do much with this, though, so you can't print it. Like I can print my browser, but it's just going to print this little bar here, right? So it really is a previewing tool, and if you really want to get a look at it, you want to download it. Um, so it does have a viewer, embedded viewer, you know, to that extent. Um, in the case of SolidWorks, it'll actually open up a separate window with embedded e-drawings in it. But in the case of other file types like this, if it can, if it's one of the basic Office types it'll put a little preview in here that you have to scroll through. Um, it also is supposed to make a PDF. I haven't found that this is 100% yet, um, but this tool is in beta still technically. So I don't know if they're gonna launch it fully with this piece in place, um, but in theory, when you click on this, it's supposed to make a PDF. Um, sometimes I get the PDF looks like this. So it's not quite ready, I would say. Um, so I wouldn't quite count on that yet, um, but it does do a pretty good job of viewing it uh, in the browser, and then you download it if you want to open it in the application. So if you click on this, it'll download it. Does the, uh, does the data card work with folders? 
So with a folder card, um, I'm not thinking there is a data card for the folder card, yeah, I don't think that's available. So um, if you do a search, it will find data that's in a folder, I'm not sure who asked that, but there's no data card for folder yet. Um, so and then speaking of searching, up here along the top is your search screen. So it's really meant to be simple. So if you've made custom search screens and things like that for EPDM, it really doesn't have all of that uh, available. So it's really just a basic search. The idea is meant to type in a number, type in a description or something and hit go. So, so if I type something in like, uh, let's see, control and hit that, you know, it gives me a list. You can see every, it's actually searching control box here. So it's searching description. If I had a file with control in the name, it would also find that too. So it is more of like um, um, really variable independent. So if I search for the value, it'll come up. If I'm limited to what I can find based on my rights, I'm still limited in here. So it's still um, blocking out things I'm not supposed to see. But it, um, the idea is the search, it's, not, it's meant to be open so that if I don't know what field I'm searching in because I'm new or I just need a quick way to find a file, I just type in the part number, hit enter, if that part number is referenced in the description or referenced in the file's name or referenced in the part number field, um, it would show you all of that, right? So, um, but that's, some of that's configurable as well. Um, so then if we jump to the um, mobile device, any questions about what you've seen so far? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Is the, uh Columns for the variables, the data, mm -hmm. that order driven to the same setting as the desktop version? So these columns here are really out of the box. Mm -hmm. And so these, uh, I think there's a couple of them that you can turn off. Um, like days and state, I believe, you can turn that off. Um, but the other ones um, are really, they're, they're, they stay in there. The extra columns that you see here, like version number, description, revision, these actually come from your EPDM um, column set. So you can define what column set you want to apply to the web. So if you're, you're defining column set in order, and that will show up here? Correct. Right, so you can add in a, a general column set in EPDM in the admin tool, just like you would for other things, and you can say use that here. It doesn't... Um, take any of these away per se, it just adds new columns to the list here. And you can expand these out and, and um, these you can sort on, these you cannot sort on. But these you can. Any other questions? I guess I'll have a couple of their hands. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about the web, that's a good point, because in the web, and this is something when you're training your users that are going to be doing versioning, when they download a file, it may download the file into their downloads. Or some of your more sophisticated users may be able to download it and pick a new spot for it. But in some cases in the web, with your browser settings, you click download, it's just downloading it into some, you know, mysterious place to a lot of people. Well, it's going to be in your downloads, and so if you're going to work on it, you got to get it out of your downloads, open it up, make a change, and then you got to upload it from your downloads or wherever you put it. So where we've seen a couple people get into trouble when we've been doing training is they'll download it, it goes in their downloads, they'll copy it to their documents, they'll check it, they'll make changes to it, and then they'll upload and upload the one from their document, their downloads. So you got to know where things have been changed in order to properly do it. Um, so, but that's just the nature of browsers and how to how you have to work like that. Any other questions? So yes, it will send notifications. Um, I'll talk about how those work because they are a little bit different. Uh, they have to be set up a little bit different in the web. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Yeah. 
if there is a task, it'll go ahead and do that as well. So it's, um, it is a little bit different if it's a task that involves some interaction. So interactive tasks, not really. Um, if it's a task that's just gonna make a PDF on the server, then that should be okay. Any other questions? Um, okay, so we'll, we'll, there'll be time too if, you have, if one comes to mind. Um, so the next part is the mobile version. I'll just touch on that quickly too. So this is the mobile version. This is what it looks like. If we make this minimize like this, this is what you're gonna see on your phone or, or device, right? So instead of being, um, you know, a tiny list or whatever, you gotta try to zoom in on using, you know, on your iPad. Well, iPad would be probably more of the other browser. But let's say your iPhone would look like this, right? So, and as you browse through it, let's say I go into engineering, it's gonna expand that. I'll go into products. You know, so as I bounce around here, it's just a button, that, so it's just a touch. On your iPhone or on your Android, you just touch it and it opens up the next one. So it's pretty nice, especially for um, things that if you need to get a quick view of something, download it to your iPhone, or if you need to open up a spreadsheet or just simply you know, approve a drawing, you can get to the drawing very quickly using a search because there's a search button at the top and the home will take you back to the home. So if you did a search, you just type in what you're looking for and hit search and it would take you to the file. You click on the file and you can do a change state right there. So like this particular part, I'm there, it shows me some properties. There's some things you really can't get to like history and some of those things that might be really important if you're gonna do approvals. But this is really, you know, for you being on the go. So on this little button here brings you into the state change where you can type in your stuff here. So that's what the, um, um, that's what the workflow would look like in a mobile device. So now we're at a different state here. So uh, any questions about the mobile device? It's somewhat limited, but that's, you know, that's what you can expect from a mobile device. It wants, you know, there's, it's very trim. You can still click on things to download. That's what this hyperlink up here will do, is download it to your mobile device. Um, and a couple other things. Yes, everything needs a license. So as soon as you connect, it's using a license. Any questions about the mobile? So I'll come back to some configuration options here just to talk about some of the different things that you can do in the system. Okay, uh, so um, configuration options. So a couple things we'll normally do right away is change the, uh, the, you know, the, the background of the main screen maybe. Maybe you want to tailor that to meet your company. Uh, or, or meet your uh, company standards or logo or color scheme or something like that. Um, if you set it to that, it'll come in there nice and clean. It'll look good. Um, obviously, for those who understand web, it's just an image that's sitting in a, in a folder. So just make a backup of the one that's there and drop a new one in. So I generally don't go in there and change any code, HTML code or anything. I just replace the current picture with the one I want. Same kind of principle for the header and the footer. If you don't want SOLIDWORKS in the corner, you don't want Enterprise PDM Web at the top, you want your vault name or something, make yourself an image that has generally these dimensions and just call the header-logo.png and dump it in the folder and then voila. So in fact, the one that's in there is Enterprise PDM Web 2 Beta or something like that is what it says on the image. So the one I use is I swap that out so it uh, looks a little cleaner. Um, so some other things that we can uh, configure. Um, so like I was saying, we can configure the header image, the footer image. We can also configure the attributes that we search on. So when I type in box into this field, um, maybe I wanna search on part name or file name. Maybe I wanna search on description. And there's a configuration option in the system to, uh, to allow you to do that. So if, it's, uh, if you wanted to search material, description, and part number, in addition to file name, 
That's part of the configuration. Correct, at the same time. So in fact, it doesn't really let you control what you're searching in. Once you've configured it as an admin, as a user, when I come in here and type in um, some, uh, some description, it just searches. It doesn't tell me what it's searching in necessarily, it just gets it to me. So that's the idea. Um, so, um, so that's all in a configuration option. Uh, the columns, like I was saying before, um, when there was another question, we can actually add columns in here. That's going to come from your EPDM column set. So you have to define it there, make a nice trim down one for yourself, use that in the web. Um, and then that's just going to drop the columns here at the end. We can also control the page size. So how many uh, items are shown here in the page by default. If you're, especially if you're doing mobile devices, maybe you want to keep that trim. Um, the configuration options are stored in an area called, uh, or in a file called web.config, which is accessible through your uh, Internet Explorer tools. I'll show you where that is. Um, also some things that can be done, uh, data card editing. So you can edit files, you can edit uh, data card data uh, from the system, and you can configure what data card values can be edited, and um, you can also control uh, what it's display, what the display looks like in the card. So um, when I'm coming into the, let me bounce back here and I can show you that in the actual web client here. So if I'm looking at a data card for this particular file, so here's the data card and it has some drop downs and things like that in it. Um, so the data card is being obviously written from what's on the card in the regular client, right? But some people will use, like in this case, underscores and things like that in their variable names. So we can actually control what they're, uh, what they're actually shown to the user through what's called a variable alias. This is set up in the config file as well. So it might be some very convoluted variable name that makes sense to you as an admin, but to the user they don't know what that is. So you, you basically tie those two things together, a simple name or whatever that you want displayed on the web. So you can do that. Um, column sets I've mentioned, the date format, how you want that displayed can be controlled. Um, Search only in latest versions. So although it will just display latest versions, you can control what the search can search into via the config tool. Um, the search variables that you can search into, talked about that. Do we want to show that e-drawing or PDF icon? So if that's something that you want people to click on, um, you can sh choose to show that. Or if you don't want them downloading the drawings on the web, you can you know, turn that off so they don't even see the icon. Um, you can also change the site timeout, which we'll, uh, we'll, sh we'll talk about a little bit too, to, uh, um, to essentially refresh the site. So uh, installation and prerequisites. So um, to install it, um, first of all, you're going to need to get the program itself. And so right now, like I was saying, it's still technically considered beta. Um, and, uh, but we do have a few customers that are using it in beta sort of. Um, so they're treating their um, users as guinea pigs and actually it's deployed in production but it's you know technically still beta. Um, to get it you have to contact your reseller. I don't think you can download, download this from anywhere, at least legally. Um, but there, um, uh, but the, the file is, the latest build is 552.121 so if you don't have that one then there's a later one available. You can get, the, your reseller can get this off of the um, off of their uh, internal network with uh, SolidWorks, their internal portal, and they can get this to you. You basically run the EXE, it extracts the files that are used for the web into a default directory. By default, it puts it into your program files directory for your, on that server where you have EPDM installed. Correct, now this would be on a server, but it doesn't have to be on your archive server or on your SQL server. But it does have to have a client installed already. So by default, you would already have a program files directory because you should install a client. You have to install a client minimum for it to work. So the program's file directory, it'll dump them there. 
And then in um, uh, what that will also do is it will open up your access to this EPDM Web 2 Getting Started Guide. So, and it has all the instructions for actually installing it, adding your application pool, adding your default, um, uh, your, your application for connecting to the web, um, the different config options. It's a nice guide and it shows you, you know, what you should have various values set to as you're uh, configuring the application. Um, so if I come into, let's say, let me come out of here. So IIS um, would need to be installed, obviously, on your, um, uh, on your system for this to work. And what you're going to do is have an application pool. I'm not going to go through all this setup, but one of the important things about the application pool is um, uh, you have to um, give it some kind of dona domain authentication. So for users to connect to this and for this um, um, uh, website to, uh, to be able to deliver out the, uh, the web pages, you need to have some kind of domain access to it. So a lot of the, when you install an application pool, it's going to be maybe network service or something as a default. So you have to give it some kind of domain login. So oftentimes we'll create a user or something like that that we use as like a service account that can run this application pool. The one thing you may notice when you, when you initially log into the system, if, this, if these credentials aren't set up properly according to that getting started document, you're going to get an error when you log in back in, the main, you know, back in your login screen. And the error is going to be something like wrong username and password. And you'll drive yourself batty trying to enter in the username and password 50 times until you realize it's not your EPDM password that's the problem. It's the credentials applied at the application pool. So that's important to have that established and follow those details uh, in that guide to a T, including security of that user in the folder structure, in the, in the web folder structure, in the directory, um, and then also their ability to, um, they also need to, generally speaking, then you also need a profile on the server. So what's worked best for us is to create that service account user, log into the server as that user, so you build a Windows profile, and that tends to um, really connect the dots, because once it's working, it's usually uh, pretty bulletproof, but the um, getting that initial uh, security set up, um, that's been about the only thing that's given us some, some fits in, in some instances. Um, once you create your application pool, you're going to create an um, a, um, application. You know, you're basically going in here and you're going to say add application. It's not a virtual directory, but an application. This is all covered in that document. It tells you how to set it all up. So once you add your application, it's going to, um, obviously you're going to see icons that look like this. And then in there, you're going to see something called application settings. These are all the settings that are part of your web config. So the column set name that we're pulling from, the allow data card editing, true or false, um, page listing, 15 there, upload path, pop-up um, windows, you know, things like that are all part of uh, what's in the config file. If you don't feel like going here and you feel a little bit more adventurous, you can go into your program files where it's actually installed. So if I go into Enterprise PDM here, into the web, web folder, there's also web config, same principle here. So all that information is here and it has various keys so you can just come through here and edit it. Um, so some people will do it through here so they can make a backup of it on the fly so if they make changes they don't mess something up. Um, so, and I would always recommend before making any config changes, make a backup of the whole, of the whole site just so you have it in its, you know, in its uh, previous you know, pristine downloaded uh, condition. So that web config is the file that you're going to be editing. Inside of images here is your various icons that it can control that main page. So some prerequisites, um, like I was saying, you're going to need a client installed on the server where you access the, um, uh, where the web server is installed. 
And so it's got to be a contributor or a editor license installed in order for it to actually allow you to do editing in the web. Uh, we've also seen people do this uh, as two separate installs. So um, you could put them, you can't put them on the same server, technically speaking. But let's say you wanted to have one deployment that's an editor kind of deployment, another deployment that's a web or a viewer. You could do that, but you need two separate servers, right? Because it's going to access the client information that's stored here. You know, so I have this installed as an editor, so it's using an editor license. If I had this flipped to contributor, it would pull one of my contributor licenses on the server. Um, and then there's some browser requirements, and a lot of this is also covered in the um, Getting Started Guide. So as they make this more available, um, they're going to keep that document updated so that, you know, it has all the, the supported browsers and everything else. So um, a couple other things on the licensing side of things. Um, so you must have an EPDM license. So that's key. Um, when, like I was saying, when you hit the web, it's doing editor contributor. Um, one of the things that is a little bit, uh, is a little bit, uh, I don't know, I guess a sticking point for a couple uh, customers where we've tried this is really the releasing of the licenses. That's the challenging part, really. So you really have to have a couple extra uh, because what happens is the licensing itself is held not by, um, it's, it's not released when I log out. It's actually released when my application pool refreshes. So because what's happening is, in a way, in kind of layman's terms, your web server is taking a license and then it doesn't release the license until the session is released or timed out. And those settings are in the application pool. And in the getting started guide, it shows you where to change all that. But basically that license refresh or that refresh of the session frees up the license so that you can log in again. But if you had, let's say 20 licenses and immediately um, you had somebody log in and out 20 times, you would see them consuming all the licenses until that refresh happened. In the application pool there is, so you can recycle at any time. Um, but what that can also do for some folks though, is if they're in the middle of some entry point, it can, it can flush them right out of what they were doing. You know, so if they're viewers, no big deal. If they're actually editing a data card when you do that, it may mess up their editing. But generally for viewing, it's no big deal. And what we've seen is um, if you recycle that while people have the, the, um, the web page open, um, most times it'll just leave it where it was. So it actually keeps you logged in. It doesn't really, it's not even really that noticeable to them. Um, uh, but it can uh, mess up if you're actually entering data. Any have, anybody have any questions about the installation? Uh, obviously, it is, wasn't really, I guess, meant to be a class to take you through every step. Um, but that information is available in the guides. Um, if you don't know how to get those, um, you know, send me an email. I'll email you the guide so you can run through it yourself if you need to. Uh, we've got a few more minutes. So some limitations. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier, uh, no template functionality. So although I can approve something, you know, I can approve an ECN, I can't create one. And that's, um, that's a big thing for people who want to deploy this out to the shop or whatever, who want to try to ask for ideas from their community of users. So I can't send this link out to somebody and get them to submit me a request, which is unfortunate. Hopefully that's something they, um, um, you know, they add in the future, but as of now, it's just really, um, it's using data that somebody else has already initiated. Um, the second thing really is the data cards do not translate too well. So if you have simple data cards, they're fine. But if you have data cards that have control by variable or control logic or you're clicking a toggle and it's changing the whole look of the data card, if you have it, those kind of complex cards, it's not going to show that well. It actually shows everything like a long list. Now it's alphabetical, so that's nice, but everything is basically in a list. So if you have multiple tabs on your data card and you can, when you add up all those visible variables on your card, 
you have like 100 variables, you're going to see 100 in the list here because there is no overlay of a tab or anything like that. So that's something just to keep, keep in mind. Does it hurt anything? Probably not. Um, in some cases, if you do have control logic that's supposed to hide variables and things, that may not be hiding them. So you may be showing people things maybe you don't intend to. So definitely check it out and make sure it, it's, it's what you expect. So that's, that's a limitation there. It will have different configuration tabs there, so you will be able to see configurations, but just not in the same way. Um, right now, there's no API for the web. So, um, you know, one of the first things I asked when they rolled this out is, can we program on it? Well, not yet. So there's no API for it yet. Once there's an API, then we can start doing creative things like maybe um, building cards and things like that in there. So. Um, and then workflows. So generally speaking, the workflows will be fine, but there are some things that it will not stop, it, you know, the, basically um, there's some things on, like on conditions and things like that, that before, as the workflow is transitioned, it, uh, you may not know as a user what's happening. So you don't get pop-up messages telling you it doesn't meet conditions. Uh, it just may just not, uh, just sit there and crank. So it's not really built to handle that right now. So. It's not like it'll necessarily fail or work. Sometimes it just works when it's not supposed to. Sometimes it'll fail, but not be obvious that it's failing because it's waiting for some input that's not available to the web. So it's important to know what kind of interaction is going on in your transitions before you just deploy this out and say, okay, you guys can all start approving in the web. So you definitely gotta test it out, make sure that that's gonna work for you. Um, so one of the big things is this authentication during transitions. Um, you know, if you have it set up right now where you have to prompt to enter in your password again on a transition, this will not work for that. Um, I want to say it just lets it go through without asking. So that might, you know, make one of your processes uh, um, not meet some standard that you have internally. So it's, some, again, something else to, to look at. Um, also on the notification side. So... If you do have your workflow sending out notifications using the basic notification tool, um, it'll still send out notifications, no problem, but it'll send the next person in the chain will get a notification taking them to the thick client. So there is no inherent link in the, in the um, basic notification to get you to the web. Not yet. Um, so we have done it under the Actions tab. So under the Actions tab, you can um, essentially fake a link to get you here. But I don't know if everybody's familiar with in the EPDMAD tool, admin tool, there is an actions tab for mailing. And there is the notifications in the workflow. So if I'm in here to, let's say my design documents here, so I have notifications, it will not, it will not put a hyperlink to the web into these notifications. Um, where you have to do it instead is in the actions. So you would basically set up an action to send a mail and you can actually write the hyperlink into that email here. And it'll embed that in there and it, you can click on it or it will take you to the web. Somebody have a question? So the hyperlink is going to be a combination of um, let me see if I have a sample. Maybe I have a sample here I can show you. Not sure if I do. I thought maybe I built a sample on one of these. No, but I can send, I can send you the syntax. You're basically inserting in um, what amounts to be, let's see if I have it in here, maybe I have it in here. No, not yet. Right, you're basically passing in that variable to folder path to file name, but you have to use some syntax around it so it knows to try to launch that in a web browser. And then that'll, that'll work pretty well. No, no. So, but it is, it does have to be uh, um, set up using the actions and not the standard notifications. They will work, yes. It'll just send out the notification and it'll have the hyperlink to the file, but that file hyperlink will be to your, to your client, actually, to your thick client. 
So um, when they click on it, it'll, it'll not do anything if they don't have it installed on their PC. Yes, yes. I, we're not doing anything special in the web with notifications. It's using your basic notifications that you set up as an admin. It should, whether that'll work, I'm not totally sure. Right. So what we're doing when we set up the actions is we're essentially saying here's a path and here's the, you know, and there's a little bit of syntax to make it so it opens in the web. Um, I have not tried to edit that in the, uh, in, the database, in the database, but in the database as well, any of your hyperlinks, it's shown in the database as like Kinesio file path. And that's what we're Okay. So that we can use with our Okay. So if you're already hacking that up, you could probably get this to work. Um, I haven't been so brave as to totally erase that yet and try this uh, at a customer. Um, at the act, at the um, under the actions, though, we've definitely got that to work. No. Nope. So when I when I transition it, there's no pop-up box that allows me to pick a user or anything like that. Nope. Uh, let's see, where was I? So that's really the biggest sticking point to make sure it works in your environment is to make sure it works with your workflows. Now for viewers, no problem. You know, they may not be transitioning files, so you might be just fine using it for viewing. And then a couple things, for, um, just as a comparison to the web access tool. Um, so it's browser independent, where the web access tool is Internet Explorer only. Um, web tool, there's no installation required besides your browser. Um, of course, eDrawings, I'm not really counting that, I guess. Um, in the web access tool, there's an ActiveX plugin required. And this has really been the biggest headache for a lot of people, is that it's hard, it's hard to get that past your security settings a lot of times. And so, as an IT person, they spend more time trying to get that installed, and they could have just installed the regular client probably faster. So uh, we don't see a lot of people messing with it for that reason. Um, now with the web tool, uh, with the new web two, you can do that. You can just get it out there very quickly with just a hyperlink. Um, embedded viewer, no embedded viewer. The web two has a simplified data card. What's nice about the web access tool is it actually has a data card. So that makes it kind of nice is that it's a formatted data card that, that you would normally see. Um, the Web 2 works with viewers or contributors. Web access is CAD editor or contributor only, so there is no viewer license that's available for that. Um, Web 2 does have its issues with workflow, workflow like we've been talking about, but it actually is better than Web access in that regard. Um, the Web access tool, uh, we've, it, it, it also has its limitations in trying to process workflow through that tool. So, it's, uh, it's Web mm -hmm. access. I have not heard anything about whether or not it's going to go away. From what I understand, they're both staying out there. The, I think where the web access tool has its advantages, if I can bring, I'll bring up a screen here on that. For those who've seen this tool, I don't know if everybody's seen this tool. This is the web access tool. I think where this has its unique need or niche that it, that it serves is really interacting with people who are adding SOLIDWORKS data. Because what's nice about this tool is I can drag an assembly and its parts in and it will build the structure for me and allow me to check it in. So it is like a little bit nicer FTP site that you can that you could put as a, as a separate login on your own uh, website or, or whatever. Does it have the folder data cards? Folder data? Yeah, I've not looked at folder data cards on here. Let's see. There you go. It does. So it's a little bit more sophisticated when it comes to cards, that's for sure. Because when I go and look at a file as well, so if I click on a file and go to properties, I can actually see its card here. You know, and it's all its glory, tabs and images and all. So that's, that part is a lot nicer. So hopefully at some point they'll get to that with the web product, with the new web. Another question? Yeah, two quick questions. One, um, on 
this point, you can actually specify where in the infrastructure you want them to create. Correct. Can you do that on the Web 2.0? No. It's, it's just top down. I think, in a way, when they designed the Web 2, it, the original intent was for it to be internal. So, where this does have a fit for more of a pick a part of your vault that you want to exp expand to external sources so that you can add a layer of security. Do you think this would be better than for, like, if you want to open up to a vendor and say, here's an assembly I want to work on, you know, check that, download it, and mm -hmm. I would say if you're if they're doing CAD work, um, that kind of thing, this tool might be um, might be easier for them to work in, okay. might be easier for you to secure. The only downside is getting it to work on their server or on their at their at their site because of the security blocks on this plugin. It's like a real headache. Um, once you can get it installed there, then generally it's okay. One thing with this tool too, you got to worry you got to worry about is if your customer also has EPDM or your supplier has EPDM, you have to be at the same version or they can't use your web and use their client if you're using this tool because it actually downloads a client install on their PC. And if it's not the same version as their local client, it's going to give them all kinds of problems there. So that's something, too, to be aware of is that if you upgrade now, all your suppliers that are using this tool all have to upgrade their client which can be a little bit of a headache. So the ActiveX control, right. So when they come back to the web, it would say you're out of date, you want to download. And so when you click download, it doesn't download from the web, you know, like from SolidWorks, it downloads it from your server. And to get that from your server to their PC, if they're not in your, you know, inside your firewall, can give, you tr give them trouble sometimes. <coughs> so it really would be very good, you know, suppliers where you have a really good relationship and you're going to be doing a lot of work together, so you can get it working, and you can, you know, generally, you know, work through the stability issues together in getting them set up. Any other questions? Yep. Um, Web two. That's a little bit of a question mark right now. So they haven't released much documentation on that. Um, from what I've been told, is you can configure it in your. Um, um, but as part of IIS. So where the web access, you could actually uh, configure some of that in the application itself. There's no option for that in Web 2 yet. Do you know the documentation? Uh, it does not. No, not at the moment. It would be more of IIS documentation at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you upgrade to EPDM 2016, what upgrades have to be done for Web 2.0? So the idea, at least, is the only thing you really should have to upgrade is the client that's installed on the server. Now, that doesn't mean they won't deploy a new web for each version. I'm, I'm assuming they probably will to add more things to it. Um, so you probably would need to do that. Um, but basically, uh, that's the concept. Um, the install, I mean, uh, it's all very simple uh, to do. So. Uh, but what uh, I'm assuming what they would do is if you had a test server, you could deploy the new version on the test server, try that out with the new client and make sure it's working okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks for attending. Thank you. Thank you.